Um. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope at the end it's not woo. Okay, uh, it's brilliant to be here, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks fantastic what I've seen so far. I'm going to be around for a couple of days. So I hope to see some more. Um, if I speak too quick, then I've got to do that and say, what do you mean? But hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, okay, good. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about prototyping the future um, at the BBC, which is kind of what my team and I do. Um, I'm head of internet research and future services for the BBC. Um, I'd give a little bit of background about the BBC, and not in huge amounts of depth, but just to kind of explain where we're coming from in the UK, uh, talk about what R&D means at the BBC, and then the way that my team works with that, and kind of where that fits, and what we do, and how we do it in a, some, in some ways it's quite a um, conservative environment, the BBC's been around a long time, but in some ways it's also a very radical environment. So hopefully there'll be some stuff in here that everyone can learn from, and ask me questions about. That's me, that's when I, oh, that, um, I think the someone, the I hope it wasn't that me, moved the, the yeah. projector. Yeah. This is a creative thing, I think. Oh. Nah. Hold on two secs. I'm glad we saw that now then. Um. Okay, I think we'll be all right. Um, this is me quite a long time ago uh, when the BBC came to my town and we were encouraged to make a TV programme. Um, so that was me at the BBC a very long time ago. I've been at the BBC 17 years. Um, along the way, I was a professional musician. Uh, my background's in uh, audio and production. Um, BBC Overview, very briefly, is the largest public broadcaster in Europe. It's not for profit. We don't make a profit. I'm going to fix that font. Sorry about this. Two seconds. Why is it doing that? It's being annoying. I might not be able to fix that for fiddlesticks. Um, we don't make a profit. We're funded by a compulsory license fee if you have a television. Uh, we're independent of government. We are not a state broadcaster. We're not a government broadcaster. We're a national broadcaster. It's very important. Uh, we're not, we don't do what the government says. Um, we're incorporated under Royal Charter. We have 70 radio stations, 10 TV channels, a large content website. Our main stuff, and this is why when I go outside the UK, I explain this. The stuff you see outside, Top Gear, um, maybe the BBC website, is just a tiny bit of what's inside. We run 10 TV channels, 70 radio networks, a massive website, a commercial subsidiary. There's 27,000 of us, and our annual revenue is about £5 billion. Um, every 10 years, um, the Queen tells the House of Parliament that this is the way the BBC is going to be run over the next 10 years. Um, so that gives us a kind of latitude to, we're not worried about year-on-year -year profit, but we're also, we don't have to constantly scrabble every year to justify what we do. But we do have to justify what we do on an ongoing basis. Um, we began in 1922, TV broadcast in 1936, Colour TV in 1967, FM in 55, a website in 93. If you notice on here, and this is something I'll come back to, the gaps between these... Um, uh, inventions get smaller. So for us, change used to take a long time. Change now happens very quickly. Um, we've got 160 staff in our three R&D labs. We've been around since 1930. We're in um, the Royal Charter to maintain the BBC's position as a centre of excellence for research and development of broadcasting and other means for electronic distribution of audiovisual material, which to be honest, that was written millions of years ago, but is still really relevant now. It, 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 whoever wrote that is fantastic, because it, it explains what we do now. In, and this was pre-internet, this was pre-television. Uh, you know. So um, we've been described as the UK's NASA. Um, the bits that R&D have done, you know, we invented noise-cancelling microphones, um, FM transmitters, colour telly, digital TV. We kind of invented the iPod, the digital audio recorder and playback, but we didn't patent it. Um, and one of the things that's different from it to an iPod is that it was inbuilt, it was a recorder. Our stuff isn't just passive. We want people to be able to create as well as consume. Tech services, again, you notice the, the speed of change. The, the gaps get smaller. Um, we, we've been on the web since 1994. Um, 
strong early promoter and adopter of web standards, and we're now the most po popular content site in Europe. So in R&D, this is kind of a lot of what we do. That standards, usage, human-computer interaction, low-level plumbing, distribution platforms, the web as a medium, identity, prototyping as a concept, big data and semantic web, archives, cross-platform, and basically a lot of other stuff that doesn't fit into that. Because there is a perception that the future is finished. Uh, that was really interesting, but uh, I, I want to hear more about that. What, what does low-level plumbing mean? Um, there. Ah. So the bits oh. underneath that yeah, underpin yeah, yeah. the internet. Um, I'll come. I'll, I'll come onto that in a minute. Um, yeah, there's a, there's often a perception that the future is finished. So um, when black and white television was it was invented, there was talk of. Oh, is it me? There was talk of disbanding the research team that had invented <laughs> black and white television. Um, uh, thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, there is a view that you know the internet as it is now is kind of done. Thank you. Great. Um, now that is a view which is more common than you might think, um, because for a lot of people and for some of my colleagues, they are very fixed on the, the now. And if you're fixed on the now, and then someone comes along and gives you the internet. Oh, brilliant. You know, this is great. How long before they see w what else the internet should do or could do or needs to do? But in R&D, we're kind of supposed to look over the wall a bit at that. And that is a challenge in a, in a production company, it, whether it's a small one, a startup, or one with 27,000 staff. Um, so standards for us are something that are vital. Um, the W3C is the thing that invents, invents, sort of invented, and definitely still runs the web. So we chair a lot of work in that, and that means that we've got credibility when we talk to them about things that we might need to change. Um, a lot of learning by doing for us, and that's kind of prototyping, to be honest. You know, I'll talk more about some specific things, but learning by doing is prototyping. And there is also often a perception that how the future should be created is someone comes along and writes it down. And they, I mean, this happens all the time, some big high up person, whether at the BBC or others, comes to me with a big list of things and says, this is great. I say, well, this is great. When are you going to start on this? And they're like, no, this is for you to do. And it's a list of stuff saying, you know, make internet faster. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the idea that what we need is more ideas is, 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 is no. We have thousands of ideas. Um, so it's always a two-way process. We always prefer um, questions and problems, not solutions to do. Um, so human-computer interaction and user experience research, um, it, it's something that there's always a pull between. You know, in my team, and I'll talk a bit more in depth about my team in a minute, my team is not just, in quotes, engineers. So we have a term that we call white coat research, which is where you put a lab coat on, soldering iron, uh, textbook. Um, and that's good, and it's vital, and we continue to do that. But a lot of the problems that we're seeing are problems that are things for users and viewers and listeners and people. And so thinking about what people might want from something is, is fine. Talking to people about what they might want is even better. Seeing them do it is even better. And doing that as part of rather cumbersome bureaucracies is sadly something that we've got quite good at. Um, Low-level plumbing, it's the kind of important bit underneath it all that underpins it. Um, Again, it's not finished. You know, there are two things at the top there, IPv6 and multicast trials, that the, the technical stuff has been done, and now it's just a case of ISP spending about £2 billion to make it um, a, a reality. How do we persuade them to do that? The papers have been written, the, 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 the VMV, the validation and verification has been done. How do we say, this is something that's good, look what we've built on top of it? So it's that mix for us of where you get something that's a, a, a deep, low-level technical standard as well as something that you can show someone. Um, so for us, distribution platforms, the iPlayer is our VOD service. Um, uh, our requests for it continue to rise, 145 million in 2010, 200 million last year, it will be 260 million this year. So the iPlayer is a fantastic achievement. Can I just put a hand up? Do people know what the iPlayer is here? Okay, some of you do. What is the Swedish equivalent of the iPlayer then? What is the on-demand service for? Mm, I think Netflix here as well. 
SVC play. I'm not okay. Swedish, I'm Danish. Fine. So, it, it, sorry, I thought we, uh, we might know. Um, so it's a fantastic um, um, uh, breakthrough, but there's a view there that it stopped. The iPlayer distributes whole programs to people via the internet. They can look at them on their PC or on their telly, and they're whole programs. And that's brilliant. But that isn't that much different through sending someone a DVD, or in the olden days giving them a VHS, or in the really olden days giving them some film. It's a complete program. It's finished. Um, breaking through that, this wonderful distribution platform, which gives you a wonderful way to see um, uh, programs in full, what can we do next with it? So the, 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 I, the, the iPlayer has now become in Britain a verb. So people will say, I, I played that. Um, and that is a massive breakthrough. But how do, what do we do next? H how do we go beyond that? Um, so something that's vital for us is the web as a medium, that it isn't just a, 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 a thing where you put old media, that, that, that the web hasn't even, we haven't even begun to think about what the web could do yet. Um, we can't just reuse old designs. When we do try and work with some people, who do, can I, are there any user experience people, designers who are good? Okay, you'll know that what I'm about to say, how horrifying this is. We, we worked with a, a, an internal division who, um, they uh, had a, 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 a brand, a colour brand, that they needed us to do some prototyping work with. Um, and we pointed out that the colour wasn't web safe of their, of their brand. The actual the hue they'd chosen, it, it, you couldn't see that colour on the, on the web. It didn't, it didn't work. And um, they got very cross. And they said, well, we have to, have to. We've picked this brand. We have to have this colour. And I said, well, there's two things. You could change your brand colour slightly by one hex value so that it was the same as one that worked. Or we could go back and we could like, start again with the whole web. <laughs> and <laughs> they wanted to do the latter. So, um, you know, when people take that view of it, it's kind of difficult. Um, for a while, Flash was an answer. And Flash still does some really cool stuff. But Flash kind of pushed... Pushed instead of looking at the web, we looked at Flash as a, a as a way to do interaction. And you know, it, what's the question there? I, if you want to do incredibly complicated, time accurate, synchronized things, brilliant Flash. Still not the web though. So just a URL. There's something we've been working on future broadcasts, which looks at perceptive media. Um, identity for us is really really vital. Um, the BBC website has always worked without a login. Like if if you go to Twitter or Facebook and you haven't got a login on there. Literally, those sites don't work. Um, we, we've never been able to do that with the BBC website. It has to be open to everyone. That means we've ended up with a site where almost personalization, in quotes, doesn't really, people don't personalize it, which means we don't know anything about our users, which means we can't offer them things. So that's one of the things that um, we've been doing work on. Um, for us, the web is a tool chain and a shop front. So, you know, some basic, to us at least, um, uh, web front ends to various things whether that's our systems administration, whether that's our code, some fairly dull things. Who doesn't like writing timesheet systems? Timesheets, document sharing, wikis. BBC's got, not in R&D obviously, but in, in the rest of it, it's got fairly locked down corporate desktop. Um, Windows XP, IE5, it is very up to date. Um, uh, 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 our way of doing stuff, building things with the web, um, means that we can get things in front of people um, uh, without having to go through change requests and fill forms in. And you know, uh, there's a theme that I'll come back to on this, and it's it's about talking to people at what you're doing. Obviously, this is one of them, but talking to people at what you're doing because then, if you only show people when you're doing something and it's good, um, when you show them something that doesn't work, they get really cross. So, getting people into the habit of seeing your team fail and your team into the habit of failing, and me ha happy to fail. And that falling faster is, 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 a, is a big startup thing, but we try and do it inside a corporate company as well. Um, so I'm trying to give you an example of some of the problems that we look at. Um, we, semantic web and, 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 and linked data was something that the BBC did a lot of work on a long time ago. Um, and then having done, a, it's Tim Berners-Lee's next big thing. And to be honest, though I don't often understand some of the semantic web, I kind of think, well, Tim Berners-Lee gets <laughs> as many chances uh, to have another idea in his entire lifetime, even if I don't understand this one. Um, so 
Um, the semantic web was a, 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 a thing that the BBC put a hell of a lot of effort into. Good, that didn't feed back. Um, and then it was only this year where, with the Olympics, which were hosted in London, where our work on the semantic web five years ago meant that we were able to build the, a fantastic Olympic site with a page for every athlete, a page for every race, with almost without breaking a sweat. That if we'd gone to a vendor, uh, you know, a big kind of CMS, kind of industrial closed source vendor, and said, please help us build uh, a, a, this Olympic site that's as big as it is. I mean, there, there wouldn't have been enough zeros on the check for them to, to write it. Whereas because we'd done this work, we were able to then um, uh, push something to live relatively easily. Um, so the, the gap there is, if you do R&D, BBC R&D used to be based in a big country house. It kind of looked like Harry. Hello? Can I expand? Um, because we'd made a lot of uh, our mistakes with our early experiments with the semantic web, where we, a USM web researcher, okay, I can say what I'm about to say then, um, where we kind of followed what a lot of SEM web researchers thought were the way to do things, and that was fine in a purely academic con 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 construct, but when we started trying to scale things above whatever, a million triples or something, um, it, the, the, the stuff fell over. So we had these attempts to be able to build up and build up to the point that when the Olympics came along, we were almost able to pull things off the shelf about what we'd done with previously with the semantic web because it was such a good fit. It's all about data, it's all about events, it's all about people, it's all about lots and lots of big data. So we were able to, you know, it wasn't that we were geniuses, it was that we'd had a number of attempts and learned each time. Um, so, right. Um, BBC's got a massive archive. It currently is sadly locked up in a big leaky warehouse. Um, uh, we are beginning to move bits of it to the web. And these are some of our products, research products there that I'll show you in a minute, hopefully. Um, this is something which is absolutely vital for us, cross-platform work. Cross-platform used to be works on a Mac and a PC. If you're really lucky, Linux. Now, oh my lord, um, it is entirely likely that normal people, and by that I mean not geeks, normal people will have 10 different devices in their front room that are capable of using our on-demand services. That, you know, it used to be there was a set-top box, maybe a set-top box, and a television. And maybe some people had PCs in there. Now, the amount of mobile phones, the amount of games consoles, the amount of set-top boxes, televisions, extra things. So even I can't work out which is the best experience to, to use our services on um, when I look at a swathe of different boxes. So one of the things that we're beginning to do is to think about one service across many devices, have a control, command and control system which spreads across them, so that we used to think about having one god box, as we called it, in the corner, which was your, your file store of video. That doesn't work anymore because your video will be scattered across all your different devices. How do we link them up? Work we've been doing on with uh, something called Radio DNS, which is available at radiodns.org, as a control system to bind new devices together to use the, the components of the DNS system itself, which underpins the internet um, or the domain name system as we know it, in order to do device lookup and so on. Um, we do a lot of work with Android. Um, goodness me, it's fragmented, isn't it? Um, it's very nice, uh, but sometimes it makes you long for a closed ecosystem. I never thought I'd say that. Um, a Raspberry Pi and little printer. I mean, I see stuff like this going on here. Um, I'll come and talk about physical, tangible things in a minute. But tangible stuff gets bosses unfeasibly excited. Um, oh, my God. You've got the internet in your thing. It's all of the internet is in there. Um, the question is, what do you then do with it that's useful rather than just cool? Um, you know, we like cool, but we also like useful. Um, so all the stuff I've talked about there is the kind of current things that we're thinking about. The next stuff for us is massively big data, more identity, mobile net and broadcast. So I can't remember. Some countries have tried mobile broadcaster handsets. Has Sweden, has it tried it? Um, it's something we're always being asked about, the idea that you're going to be on the move with your phone and you're going to watch Shakespeare or something on the bus, like a four-hour 
film on, on your commute. Um, I, I remember Norway did a couple yes. of years ago, but I can't remember Sweden if they ever did it. Nope. So I don't think Norway still got it. No. Nope. Most countries that tried it haven't still got it. However, it's a big challenge. It's like artificial intelligence. It keeps coming around. It's like the cure for cancer. Someone will actually crack it. Hooray. And you don't say, oh, no, they've all tried it and it didn't work. These are big problems, which we wouldn't do all the time. I mean, I went to an R&D department, not in the BBC, uh, who, who do mobile broadcast stuff. And literally, a room this size littered with old attempts to make telev televisions on mobile phones. Um, it was quite sad. Um, Handoff and caching, when you move between you know, your one network tower and another, how do you make that ex seamless experience? Um, so at the moment, people do it by downloading stuff. But how do you do it when it's kind of uh, on the move? Um, lots of possibilities. Lots of the last one there, the production thing, IP end to end for all our content. At the moment, a lot of our content is still made like that camera there. Someone films something, and then they take a tape or a disc out it might be a digital disc, but it's still it's a sort of like a tape. And then they put it in a computer, and then they ingest it, and then something else happens to it, and then you can view it, and we squirt it around our studios. Increasingly, that doesn't isn't how we work in R and D. Our stuff, all of our cameras, are going to be IP enabled. There isn't going to be a tape, a physical thing. What does that mean? Um, you know. So that was a big long intro to R and D at the BBC. Um, my team is Internet Research and Future Services. We work, I know that's really annoying me, but if I stop, it will make my flow and only a few of them are cut off. I'll talk through when it's cut off. We work at the audience end of the broadcast chain. We have a full range of skills. Engineers, designers, producers. I talked a little bit at the beginning about why white coat R&D is vital, but why human factors are also vital. And this is one of the reasons we do lots of partnerships with academia, is because working with them, we get the ability to work with ethnography, anthropology, sociology, and so on, which the BBC doesn't have those on staff. We have research scientists on staff, some of whom aren't engineers. But for us, it's about thinking, why would someone use this, not why should we build it? Um, there we go. This is, a, this is an org chart, isn't it? Okay, I won't talk you through all the detail, but these are the... Is this going to collapse if I stand on it? Oh, God. No, no. Really? Didn't okay. know I did. These here are five areas of our uh, work. I've explained those textually earlier, which we're interested in. As we move to the left, these get vaguer and vaguer. So hopefully there's only a couple of the ones in this super vague bit. Um, for us, attempting to put things together thematically as part of our prototyping process. So sometimes, literally, someone comes along to see us and they say, um, oh, we think we should think about new interactions. And we say, we think about new interactions all the time. What, what does that mean? Um, and someone somewhere has said, oh my god, they've just come back from Silicon Valley, or they've come back from seeing Korea, and they had a new interactions department. And so part of what we do is then take these rather vague concepts um, and then kind of refine them and iterate them until eventually these ones here, the ones with the hard lines, is where we've actually been funded by the Commission, European Commission or others to work on them. Um, our fund, I'll talk a bit about our collaborative approach, but our funding is we're basically paid for by the BBC, but we also, like an academic or university, we do collaborative projects, some of which are funded. Um, I've, talked to, uh, I've explained quite a lot of this, but for us it's about building new things to try them out and to explore. Um, and I suppose that's what prototyping is. My department that I run used to be called prototyping. I think that might have been where mm. we found out about me. But um, we got pressed to move away from that, and I was like, oh, not another name change. But the reason was, was because defining ourselves by what we do was fine when we were this relatively radical approach to it, but increasingly prototyping is what the rest of R&D does. And that was a good thing. At least that was the way it was explained to me. Um, so our, our time horizon is about five years, which for those of you in academia will seem like really short, probably. And for some of my Silicon co colleagues who work on set-top boxes, that's really short. But then you work, talk to someone in a startup, and that seems quite a long time. Um, we work with people <coughs> all around. We work with big program makers in the BBC. And this is um, uh, s something we've learned over the years, that um, if you're working with someone who you need them to provide you something, so some content in quotes or some user stories or some things like that, go as high up and as important as you can go to get those. Don't 
go in through your mate who works there or through the intern or through the whatever because it's harder to get approval from the big programs, in this case Doctor Who, or the big bosses. But once you've got it, they stick to it, and then the rest of their team know that they can't drop it. And the amount of times we worked with other teams in the past, who we did quite a lot of work on, and then they sort of said, oh no, we, we dropped that bit. And we said, no, 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 really, we've done seven months' work. <laughs> and they said, well, it didn't fit. Um, so, you know, um, Spring Watch, we had another issue where something didn't fit, and it was, um, we worked on a a live second screen thing a few years ago. Um, we wanted to work with a, um, a, a TV program. It's a lot of companion screen stuff that we see is quite frenetic. It's kind of mm, 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 in your face. It's my God, it's colourful, I'm really confused. Uh, the, 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 the Spring Watch is for older people. It is a nature show. It's really gentle. It's, if you've seen Frozen <laughs> uh, Planet, um, it's a really slow, gentle show. And we worked with them on this second screen app, and it was live. And that was one of the interesting things we thought, was working with a live second screen app. So we, um, we worked a lot with the program makers, and we made a lot of e extra content. And then on the night in the studio, we were in the galley, one of the badgers wouldn't come out of its hole. And so the director said, uh, I'll lose the badger, go to the next one. And that really, we had put loads of effort into that, that extra bit. So... Um, we couldn't really ha get cross with anyone there. But learning something like that, when we did something, I've made live radio programs many years ago, learning something like that about digital experiences around live events, that there was something we would never have predicted that the Badger had basically wasted three months of our time. <laughs> um, so, um, working with academia and SMEs and collaborative projects, we do those not just because of the money, we do them because we get to work with fantastic partners. Um, and and, and you know, one of the things about prototyping, if you do it on your own too much, um, it's kind of like I don't know, cutting your own hair. It seems like a good idea at the time. Um, you, you, the more that you can bounce off people, um, uh, it w even, I mean, yes, it will come with money sometimes, but the more you can bounce off people, the, the better. And different collaborative projects are a, a, a good way to do that. Um, working in the open is incredibly important for us. Um, you know, we write, so with all those different URLs which have gone blue because I've clicked on them and I can't work out how to turn them off. Um, the most important of there, I think, isn't our source code. Um, it's our week notes. We write a, a weekly activity blog, uh, log of everything we've been doing. And if you look at weeknotes.com, you'll see that lots of other people uh, in sort of R&D do the same. Um, we, we don't want to take any credit for inventing it. Um, but we've kept it up. We've kept it up for over two years now. And it's a kind of informal, this is what we've been up to, some pictures, some chat, some stuff. And we get a lot of grief about it, a hell of a lot of grief. Your stuff, it's, this isn't important enough. You were writing about going to the pub and, you know, you were doing, writing about this. Um, but getting into a rhythm of saying, this is what we did, this is why it worked, this is why it didn't work. And it also means when we interview people to come and work for us, it's not acceptable anymore for them not to know about what we do. Whereas before, a lot of the time, they literally had no idea what we did because it was in an R&D department and it was kind of behind. We've got a big, you know, BBC's got a big uniform guards at the front to keep people out. It literally has. Um, but now that we're getting stuff out there, there's no excuse. And the amount of benefits that have accrued from it, from people mailing us, saying, hello, you're working on this. It's people that might have been too nervous to mail us before. They can see that it's quite informal. They can see that there's names against things. Um, the, the, a, a blog is obviously, who hasn't got a blog? I mean, you know, it's really bleak seeing blogs that were last updated nine months ago, isn't it? Um, especially corporate ones. So the blog for us is a more formal place where we put white papers and so on, whereas the wheat notes and stuff is this continual chatter. And it can get too noisy and it can get a bit, but um, it, it really helps with what we, when we're trying to disseminate. And then we get into more formal conferences, standards bodies and so on, which is, for us is our bedrock. So. These last two here, sorry, last three, white papers, conferences, standards bodies, that is how traditional R&D is done. So we do that and we do the other stuff. And we don't think it's either or. Um, so corporate R&D traditionally has a different pace to it. So, you know, in the olden days, we literally, someone would write us a letter. We are going to launch a commercial TV station in seven years' time. Thank you. And then we'd have seven years to prepare for that. Um, it doesn't work like that anymore. So now a new service can be conceived, developed, tested, deployed, bought by Google, shut down by Google in less than 12 months. Um, loads of our new 
the kind of competition or our peers on the internet come from the west coast of America where <coughs> there's a strong tradition there obviously of ad supported media there's also a strong tradition of paper use there's absolutely no tradition of public sector media or a national newspaper or a national radio so you know kind of where does that leave us how it leaves us is we we kind of do stuff we were asked about 10 I was asked about 10% time the other day um, all of our core research is kind of our own 10% time, leaving, so a tactical is a bit of stuff we get told to do something sometimes, you know, sort this thing out, with, and it's within our skill set, leaving the really radical 10% time for stuff that's just out there, and I don't even ask to look at that anymore. Um, that doesn't work. Okay, so a, a, a typical short-term project for us, so we work in about eight-week cycles, um, so about a third of the first, uh, about a third of the whole project should probably be talking and reading and looking at existing research. Um, that feels like a long time for non-R&D teams. That of an eight-week project, you'll spend about three weeks not doing anything at the beginning except reading other bits of work. The reason for that is so that we can, well, sometimes we say build upon, but other times we say steal, we can steal existing research in that area, which is great. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons that, and thankfully this was, was the case, one of the reasons that the military research isn't exactly um, uh, cutting edge is because none of the military research teams talk to each other because they're kind of at war. But thank God for that, because if they did, they'd build a super weapon. Um, so for us, reading what our peers have done in the past is the most important thing at the beginning of a project. And that can stop the project dead in a good way. Look, someone else tried to do exactly the same thing. It's the same approach we would have done. They wanted the same outcomes. This is what they found. This is in itself a reason to not do any further. So for a lot of what we do, not going any further is a, is a success. Kind of difficult to explain to people in the BBC. And the success was that we didn't do any more on it, and it didn't go anywhere. But that might have stopped another more cumbersome or lumbering department putting two years of ten people on it. So the first bit is the research, then exploration. So this ranges from um, workshops within our team through to our just kind of rather cliched ideation sort of stuff. Um, sketches and proofs of concept which get more physical the more that we um, get interested in, 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 in a project. So build from lo-fi to hi-fi. So we have a problem when we test with, with, with users often that Users, when they, s and I imagine this will be the case for some of you too, when they see something that's finished, and certainly when they see something with the BBC logo on it, they're hesitant to criticise it. So you've done the work, and then all of the, you know, the, the evaluation looks positive, and then when someone that <laughs> knows you and isn't shy of saying it uses it, you realise it was a disaster and that the users were basically lying to you. Um, so how do you get around that? Well, one of the ways we do that is we, we put things in front that are deliberately unfinished, so it clearly can't be a real thing. We also increasingly use cardboard and scissors so that when they want, they say, we want, you know, I wouldn't do it this way, I'd like to change it, we give them the cardboard and the scissors and say, well, there you go. But I mean, even then, you know, we were doing some evaluation in a, a series of uh, various personas, how, you know, real people who were um, uh, fitted with various personas. And one of them was about, so I mentioned earlier, service following. We were trying to um, prototype how you might walk around your home and different music or different radio stations or different <coughs> news came on in different rooms, audio, depending on the scenario. Nothing particularly spectacular, but we wanted to work out what people might do. So for this, we built, out of cardboard, we built little pretend radios in each room and as the person walked around them or the kids whatever walked around we'd be running around with like laptops behind them and turning things on to simulate it and at the end they asked if they could keep it <laughs> um and we, we said keep what the, the, the cardboard the, the us running around in their in their head they 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 it had become real um and that was kind of scary but it was also good because it showed that this concept we were worried that there was too many kids basically in this house and it would just be total chaos and that as they ran in and out there'd just be a cacophony of noise but it wasn't we tested it and it worked but along the way we had this realization that even when we go low tech users still kind of the magic's there and how we want to remove that magic 
You want the magic in the finished thing, not when you're testing to see if it works. George, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. You just uh, have to ask a question because what mm -hmm. you're talking about here is so interesting. Uh, it sounds like you're using prototyping methods that we had in rapid gaming, kind of rapid game uh, yes. development because it was so expensive. Yes. And also in interaction design and interactive exhibitions, that's exactly the method we used. The yeah. earlier, the better. Yes. Simulate, simulate with big groups, also yes. because else people won't tell you a real opinion. So yes. where did you get these methods from? Was it something mm. you invented? Where did you Well, look? no. So, I mean, the, the, I mean, a lot of these aren't particularly radical, what we're saying. Mm. I mean, they might sound radical if you're in a production division. Mm. Um, these are just the way that we... These, a lot of these have evolved. We work a lot with games mm. people. I've just hired someone from a yeah. games company. Uh, a lot of our team are you as experienced professionals. We've worked with some consultants. Mm. We've kind of, you know, in terms of... Uh, the, the, the software development approach that we've taken, we've kind of ended up with a, a mix of Kanban and, and XP, if anyone knows either of those. Um, we, it works for us, mm. really. It's, it's iterative and it's honest. Um, the, the, the challenge is doing something like this. It's fine when it's just a pure blue sky thing. You've got eight weeks, go and do this. Doing that on a four-year project gets tricky. Um, but we continue to do it that way. Um, and that, that needs quite complex project tracking, um, but still quite, you know, every sprint is, is a new attempt. <laughs> um, so, you know, approaches. <laughs> this, this is one of my bleakest European Union meetings where I had to go and sit at uh, the, uh, it, the, the guy, it wasn't even his presentation. <laughs> Someone else couldn't do it, so he had to do it. And halfway through it, he started disagreeing with the guy's <laughs> presentation in front of us. And, um, yeah, how to build things is not to do them like this. Um, it obviously, there are some things, medical devices, aeroplanes maybe, where you have to have uh, a kind of view at the beginning. But every time I see this, it doesn't work. And every time that someone says, well, I've done it this way in the past, this time it needs more bureaucracy. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's really quite, quite sad. It doesn't work for production, it doesn't work for research, it doesn't work for prototyping. Um, so trying to be in the same place if possible, it's not always possible. So we'll out, my team is split across three sites in the UK and we do collaborative projects across 27 territories in the world. So clearly that can't be always um, uh, the, the mantra. But there's a tradition in R&D of cellular offices and people going off and coming back. I always call it geeks bearing gifts. They come back with the thing. Um, uh, try and be near each other as much as possible because the time to be on your own and to think is when you've all worked out what you're going to do, not later on. And far too often we see, especially uh, on, on a really new project that's so vague, we end up with four instead of coming in and merging, it's four different approaches to the project, which are completely um, uh, orthogonal to each other. Um, this was, uh, we bought a, a, one of Berg's little printers, and I remember I talked at the beginning about the IoT thing. So um, <laughs> we went through uh, nine rolls of it, with it just um, printing out nonsense, jargon. Um, which was really depressing because um, uh, we were all excited and we wanted to get used to it and we all felt quite stupid that, that um, <laughs> we'd been wasted uh, all of the paper that came with it and ordered some more before we could get it working. Um, but it was also quite nice because um, when it got working, instead of seeing that, we saw little it printing out things, it printing out Wi-Fi addresses or it printing out whatever we were trying to do with it. And so being happy about failure... So if you haven't got a contract or a, an agreement with your boss or whoever you pro or your lecturer or whoever you're prototyping for, that you will fail. So the co it, if we'd only been allowed to do this on the basis that the first one would have worked, that wouldn't have just been a waste of money. Purchasing the thing would have been a waste of money and we'd have stopped. So build in how much you're allowed to fail at the beginning. And if you're lucky, um, and my current boss is like this, he always makes me try and fail more, um, which is great. That isn't always the case. You can't always have that luxury. But you can say, we're not going to start thinking about this until you let me know how much I'm allowed to fail on it. Um, because that in itself changes the question and the debate. Um, 
because that's up, of course they, they if they if they're new to this they'll say I don't want you to fail at all and you say well I can't do it then in that case because I know I'm going to so it can be quite cyclical but um, uh, I think it's useful um, practice with paper I mean I talked about the um, um, uh, the, 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 the thing about putting something in front of users that's that's uh, physical but also this was um, some work we were doing about um, a new virtual studio um, and you know we kind of went off down a track at the beginning where we were going to go and see a real studio and we were going to hire and we were gonna, and instead we drew how it could work how if it, if if all of our suppositions were correct what would the studio look like and we worked out that actually that wasn't what was wanted at all so just by using two bits of paper and some little plastic plasticine we saved ourselves possibly six months of work and quite a lot of cash because that was going to be the end goal if all of our research had paid off. And then as soon as we looked at it, we said, but hold on a minute. I, I can't even remember. I think it was theatre in the round and we only, had, we only had the ability to film from two sides. Um, so, you know, the, the paper is, is a, 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 a really underused way of um, assessing quite hardcore R&D. Um, yeah, releasing early, release often. I know it's a real cliche. Um, and that I, I, I don't know if anyone is, any software engineers here? Do some of you go to really glum conferences where people pay an enormous amount of money to kind of be a cheerleader? Sort of, you know, I've been to those, yeah. And that's kind of one of the things they say. But they say it so that you can then fire the people that aren't doing it well, which is kind of a lot of what that kind of approach to software engineering is about. For us, it's more about, it's the ability to take risks. No one dies. And then um, what can you gather from what you've, what can you pick from what you've done? And if you're putting it out there and open, quite a lot of the time, other people will make use of the stuff that you thought you, you couldn't use. Um, so I hesitated about putting this one up there because it, does, it is such a mantra of, of kind of software engineering. People that put on their LinkedIn a self-described hard man, um, which I, I always like. Um, so kind of that's a bit of a rattle around. <laughs> quite a lot of what we, we do. I mean, these are the conclusions that are just from looking at this as a presentation, if you asked me conclusions, say, six months ago, I might have had a different approach. The, our approach to this has changed. We haven't got, a, 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 we're not religious about this at all. But, you know, normally, unless it's a secret of your, your company or your whatever, open R&D is normally the best. Your work is your best advert. Your work is also your best shot front. Your work is your best recruiting tool. You know, there are a few people that can get away with launching a stealth startup and it just says on the front, you know, someone's name and then next to it, you know, you'll see it when it's there. But most R&D departments aren't like that. So show your workings. Don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, the reason for that is because, um, you know, so many times, especially when we have people come into us from production divisions, the first thing they want to do is, ah, yes, finally, you know, I'm going to do, I don't know, um, certificate email properly. Finally, uh, second system syndrome. You know, it's R&D, I can do what I want. I'm going to do something that I've always wanted to fix. And that that isn't necessarily the right approach at the beginning. It's more, much more iterative. Um, you yeah, knowing what you're here for. You know, I, t I showed that um, thing with our themes. Um, that was something that we've, we've been working up for some time, defining your approach or your whatever. But also, there are some bits of work that we've done that don't fit in that at all. So yes, have clarity, yes, have an approach, but also sometimes just say, you know what, that sounds interesting. Um, yeah, f learn from others. You know, there's a lot of groupthink about stuff on the internet, I'm sure people have seen. There's a lot of, well, everyone's doing it this way. Um, um, don't get seduced by that. Um, have fun, not just because, um, you know, it's, it, 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 no one's going to die, but because that's the best way to, 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 to work harder. You know, that sounds like real management nonsense, but... Um, uh, that's when we prototype the best it's, it's when we make physical things according to the um, uh, criteria I show where everyone's involved user experience engineering and so on and at the end of it um, you know uh, something tangible and good comes out of it so I've got a couple of demos and then I think I'm almost up so some time for some questions okay mm -hmm. so um, this here is so I'm running this off my, I couldn't get a DHCP lease off the thing, and so I'm, I'm running this off my, this, so this might not be super fast. Um, this is, um, uh, we got access to the um, World Services Audio Archive, which is 70 years, goes back 70 years, it's three years end to end. 
um, of audio. And um, uh, the metadata in it ranges from wrong, so programs that were made in 1809 or 2099 or the 1st of January 1970, um, wrong at best, um, non-existent at worst. So we built something which um, does speech recognition across the archive and then um, um, tags the content that's in it based on, um, based on the um, uh, topics within the audio. So you can see here, this program, um, all of the sources for these tags on the left-hand side have come from the audio itself. So that's speech recognition um, on the, uh, the, the archive. One of the problems we found there was that English language um, speech recognition, most of it is attuned to uh, America and West Coast of America approach to speech rec. People on the BBC don't speak like that. People on the World Service, which is our global kind of people from India or China, they certainly don't speak like that. And this was all 50 years ago. So we had, quite, we had to crack quite a lot of problems with speech recognition. Um, why, we've, why I'm showing you this one, I mean, you know, there's a whole load of stuff that we're, we, we're, we do, but why I'm showing you this one is because we've taken two approaches to this. We've done this thing which is um, uh, automatically tagged all the content in there, matches it against DBpedia so that the, um, uh, the, the vocabulary in the word is kind of matched against that and Wikipedia. But we've now we've opened it up to the users. So we've got a beta panel who are kind of suggesting um, new ideas, uh, sorry, new, new, new images and so on. But they're also adding their own tags. Um, so we think this is a mix of it's two things. It's, uh, it's quite low level, you know, a lot of white papers, a lot of scientific stuff, low level speech recognition, pushing state of the art. But it's also an experiment, which is something that's quite difficult for the BBC, in um, uh, opening something like this up to the end users. And you can see, you know, some of them, they're quite, um, they're quite well, this guy's quite techy here. This guy is giving us this version of Opera he's running. Thank you. But the others, you know, he, I don't think Piero Angelo is that techy. Um, so we had quite a, a, a challenge within the BBC to, um, to put something which is unfinished like this and is part of our crown jewels in front of end users. Um, but what we're seeing is that, you know what, um, Wikipedia isn't just a, a weird anomaly. Um, it users are, not everyone's tagging. We're seeing things basically 1, 9, 90, which is what we'd expect. 1% of the users in this are creating their own tags. 9% are voting up and down on other people's tags. 90% are just using it. But it's this, for us, it's this mix of um, uh, ongoing, uh, rapid, uh, low-level R&D mixed with putting it in front of users. Um, that means that um, you know, along the way, we've kind of added in some stuff that's relatively straightforward that we didn't even think about. It was so obvious to put an on this day thing in there. It was so obvious to put an in the news thing on there. But then the listeners all wanted this. So this was something that they'd got used to ex seeing on other archives. Um, okay. Right, I'll show you two more quick things. Um, so this is what we're doing um, with uh, recommendation systems. That um, Recommendation systems, by and large, are pretty hopeless. Um, and uh, you have to fill in about 8,000 forms. So um, we don't like either of those. So this is an attempt to, with just two clicks, it suggests stuff for you to watch on the BBC. And the more that you tell it what you like or don't like, the better it gets at re recommending you stuff. Um, so this front end is relatively straightforward. Um, but what we are getting out of it is we're getting so much more usage about what people, um, uh, what programs, a person who likes X also likes or dislikes. Every other bit of work we've, we've done and I've seen in this space the, 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 the algorithm is hidden behind a really complicated interface. This one is so simple, but this was um, our sixth go. This previously was so much more complicated. It still had the same bit underneath it. We've thrown so much stuff away on this. But we've got something now that literally two clicks, and it gives a better recommendation than when we've put three years' worth of work matching someone's preferences against something else and something else. And that was a real, a real kind of step forward for us. And something that's really kind of weird and radical, but um, you know, I kind of like it, is a completely different approach to um, looking at TV programs, where you cut by basically by um, time against humour, and then you see here I'm getting suggested um, uh, various programs, whether they're 
very serious um, and, and old or uh, very non-serious and new. So with this, we managed to work with a lot of um, psychologists about what makes a program um, serious and, 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 and funny, and we're also matching that against uh, programmatic analysis of the programs to see if humans say that program's funny and psychologists look at why they think that's funny, can we do that programmatically rather than at the moment asking people, is this funny? So that was a bit of a whistle-stop to that tour through quite a lot of stuff that we do. So um, I hope that that was useful. Um, have you got questions? Do we have a mic in the room? There it is. Yes. Do we have a question in the back? I thought I saw a hand. I'll, I'll try a question, but my voice is going so Okay. Well. It's going fine. <laughs> okay. Um, yet you said that the matching between the psychologist's view there at the end, I was quite interested to know what kind of um, algorithm or approach you would use to thinking about how you might programmatically put that into place. How you might, sorry, how you might, how you might what? Programmatically, how you might program that. Um, you know, to convert that into an algorithm that where you could automate uh, that process. Uh, so, I mean, that has been done. That's the that's the bit underlying this. Yes. Yeah, so um, can you elaborate? No, I'm not. It's a member of my team who's a specialist in specific mood. Um, there are a lot of white papers about it. Um, so, what we were interested in there was testing <coughs> the algorithm which has been created against um, humans evaluating it and how accurate was it. And at the moment, it's getting pretty good. So I have a question about, is this a good way to navigate TV programs? <laughs> but that isn't the point of this. Yeah. There was one other question okay. about um, the interdisciplinary work. Yes. Obviously, there's a lot going on there. Can you sort of say in what the, um, you know, with what is the challenge for you, for you at the BBC with yeah. the interdisciplinary work, what, you know, summarise, so, and what has been the critical yeah. success? So I think the challenge is the same as everywhere for interdisciplinary work, which is different, um, uh, different disciplines have different timelines, different time frames, and different approaches. Um, and the key, I think, is not to have, absolutely not to have a client-customer relationship, because that's just a disaster. You know, I hired almost. I interviewed someone recently, and this person's interview. They talked about how they'd move the designers out of the office they were in into another building, um, and I couldn't believe that. I just couldn't believe that anyone would. Do. He was very pleased with that. He said, "Oh, we got a lot more work done." Um, so I think it can't be client. It really can't be client um, uh, customer. Um, I think. We have, we, there's, a, there's a concept in the BBC, and I'm sure it'll be familiar for a lot of you, of producers. Uh, and they kind of were in vogue a few years ago in, in web companies, and I think they've gone a little less popular now. It's more project managers, and we think the two are separate. We think the, 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 the producer is the one who kind of argues for the features, and the project manager is the one that helps make them happen. Um, and I think that, as, almost as mediator, um, I think is, 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 is important. Um, I think it's also important to let... Um, there's sometimes, I might be in my team, but I've seen it in others as well, there's sometimes a kind of um, uh, hierarchy, which is, you know, engineering's difficult, design is easy, or it's pictures. If you've got that, you, you just, you, you're in a lot of trouble, because it isn't. Um, so how do you get that across to a team, who some of whom might have, might, might have grown up with that? That's a challenge. I don't think there's any disciplines or skill sets that should or shouldn't be in there. Um, I think, you know, having, we always try to have people on staff rather than as freelancers because then you can take more risks. So I know that isn't always possible and there are some, some things where we do have a specific freelancer who does a skill that we'll only need once a year. Um, so we don't do much CAD work, for example. We don't do much 3D printing, for example. Um, so I don't necessarily know that if you weren't doing something physical, if you wouldn't need those all the time. I'll come back to that. It's a good question. I don't, th I think, I don't think there's any... Saying, if I can just jump in, is that it's the mutual respect for each other's discipline yeah. and the sharing of experience and trying to understand the multiple perspectives. Like. Yes, 
but one would hope one would have that with every workplace. So I don't mm. think that's just because they're different disciplines, right? You'd hope there'd be mutual respect. I would say if we combine that with what we have a lot in Europe, experience economy, where people start working across borders and markets, what we did experience then, what we also experienced, especially in the narrative field and transmedia storytelling, is um, semantics. We don't understand the same words. Uh -huh. And when we say a game, we don't understand the same about that. And especially anything that's value-based, like this is going to be a quality production, which might, in a commercial firm, means we spend five hours on something visual, and for um, an editor film director, it means two weeks. So we found out that there's a lot of words, and nearly from the field where we work in, um, or in where I've been working a lot, sometimes we simply do dictionaries for each project. So one thing is words, the other one is the hierarchy, we experience that as well. Uh -huh. And it just doesn't work with development in a hierarchical uh, order. Yeah. Uh, people that you hire, uh, where you decide their salaries, they won't give their full uh, if they feel you're their leader. So that's the other thing, creating feelings, circumstances, arenas, um, emotional spaces. Uh, I think the third is profiles, that you sometimes come up with new names for functions or you mm -hmm. find out that you need a function that's in between two disciplines. But I also will say a lot of these people attracting to this kind of workplace and this environment are very often people who have a, a, a split background. Musician uh -huh. and department leader, and nearly everybody I know who works in this field, are kind of at least have two disciplines to work with. And if your team has that, it's easier for them to understand that there might be another perspective. It is, but that's a difference to traditional R&D, which is about mm. one specialism and, and like that. Um, so that, that's a challenge if you're working with established departments, I think, as well. We're going to take one more question, okay. and then you'll just have to head on George out okay. there. <laughs> so let's take another question. Yeah, I knew that. Tiffany. Uh, there's a mic all the way down there, but you might as well use mine. It's faster. <laughs> Um, uh, forgive me, <laughs> Georgie. Um, I was really interested to hear of your use of Semantic Web yes. you know, very early on and how beneficial that was for you for the Olympics. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know if you had any more projects that you're able to discuss that the Semantic Web is also beneficial for. Um, so the World Service thing that I showed you there, that, that uses it in, in, in an enormous amount. So we do that in a practical sense there. What we do is... When we've um, done the speech recognition on the, uh, the, the audio uh, files, we then extract from that what we think the topics that the show's about. We then match those topics against DBpedia to make sure that these are actually topics. Uh, we have spelt the person's name right. So in doing that, that then gives us... There are some things... So there's some stuff that uh, the work we've done is much worse than a human listening to it, obviously. But there's a lot of stuff where it's significantly better because no human... This is a four-hour magazine show about ten different things, and it was on 20 years ago. No human is going to know all of those topics. Um, no expert, no one expert will know all of the spellings of those words and all of that. So there, when we match against the, the, the stuff from DBpedia, that gives us a, a huge benefit. It then gives us another benefit, which is where we can then move from there to then extract terms from Wikipedia, because that's based on the same vocabulary. So that is a fantastic example of, of where there's real we've, it leaps and bounds. It saved us about six months' worth of work, I think, on that. Um, yes. Thank you very much, George. Okay. That was amazing. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>